Well, again, good morning. Welcome to the Sierra Bible Church. Uh, my name is Carl. I'm the senior pastor around these parts. And if you brought your Bible, please open with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 18 through 25. Uh, it has already been read to you this morning, and uh, we are going to expand, expound. We're not going to expand upon it. It's, it's, it's sufficient for, for everything that we need, but we are going to expound upon what God has revealed for us this morning. We're going to be in verses 18 through 25, and we are going to see the story of the creation of the first woman. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw the creation of the first man. Last week, we saw the driving purpose that God had given to the man. And today, we are going to continue God's story with the creation of the woman. Uh, but as you're turning there to Genesis chapter 2 in your Bible, I want to ask you a question. I want us to, to think about a, a question as we are walking through the text this morning. And the question is very simple. But the question is this, who are your people? Who are your people? Who is the, the group of people in which you can say, this is home. This is where I belong. This is the, the community of people who know me and who also I know. Who are your people? To whom do you belong? If last week's driving question for the creation of man is, what is your purpose? To this week's question that the creation of woman is, who's your community? Who's your group of people that you belong to? And this, these questions come from a, a central idea that, that are driven by an important universal truth. And it is the big idea for the message this morning. And it is this. We shouldn't be alone. We shouldn't be alone. We are going to see today in the story of the creation of women, it answers four questions about community. It answers the need for community the insufficiency of our work to create community, the goodness of gender, and the cultivation of a new community. Now, I know that the Christmas season has passed us. Uh, I know that uh, we, we've already put away all of our tinsel and our Christmas trees and uh, our Christmas lights, and, I, and I, I believe Christy Kronk is still grieving the reality that, Chris, that uh, Christmas is, is done and over with. Jeff affirms that. But let's just indulge ourselves for a moment and let's ask ourselves the question, what is the greatest Christmas movie and why is it Home Alone? <laughs> now, if you have seen Home Alone, famously Kevin McAllister it is a boy in the opening scene that is being, being treated unfairly by his family. His older cousins and his older siblings are barking down commands on him. They're shaming him for not, being, not knowing how to pack his own suitcase. And they're needing to travel uh, all the way, uh, all the way to, uh, for, a vacation, for, for a vacation the next day. And they're all shaming Kevin. And so in the opening scene, and the opening scene, after shame upon shame being thrust upon Kevin, he throws a temper tantrum in, his, uh, in the top floor of his house, and he stomps his feet, and he exclaims, when I grow up, I'm living alone. And it's that thesis that drives the narrative for the next 90 minutes to show Kevin that if he gets what he wants, he's not going to be fulfilled as a boy. Unlike Kevin McAllister, I am praying that today we are going to take a journey through Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and view these scriptures through the, the, through the lens of Kevin's opening affirmation and ask the question, is it good for a man to be alone? The story of God continues in verse 18 of chapter 2, answering this particular question. Is it good for a man to be alone? 
without any impulse or stimulus from the outside. God himself initiates the answer to this question in verse 18. The man wasn't in the garden saying, I'm so lonely, please provide somebody else for me. God, at his very own initiative, in verse 18, says this. In verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. The man wasn't described as lonely. The, 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 God wasn't being manipulated in any specific way to see that, to see that, to, to see that it wasn't good. God, it simply states that the man is not designed to be alone. This is the first time in all of Scripture, as we've seen in chapters 1 and the beginnings of chapters 2, that God describes something as not good. Remember, in chapter 1, when he creates the world, after each successive day of new creation that he designs, he declares that creation good. And now, for the very first time, after the man is created to work and to keep the garden, God declares that it is not good for the man to be alone. Verse 18 continues. I will make a helper fit for him. The seas were filled with fish. The, the skies were filled with birds. The, the earth was filled with beasts. But for Adam, there was no helper fit for him. No companion, no partner, no person to provide a measure of community. A helper is, is a powerful worker. God, God himself is even described as Israel's helper later in the Old Testament. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 7, for the tribe of Judah, he, it says this, with your hands, O God, contend for him and be a help against his adversaries. The psalmist three times in Psalm 115 says, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Oh, Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and the shield. Who, uh, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. And potentially the most famous of description of God as helper comes in Psalm chapter 121, when God, or when the psalmist declares, I look, I, I point my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Far from being something that is subservient to the man, God desires to create a helper, one in whom bears God's image to partner with the man. His equal, his companion, a helper fit for him. God would complete humanity to fulfill humanity's purpose by creating the first community of a man and a woman. Have you ever ate pizza without cheese? It's not pizza. It's breadsticks with marinara sauce. It might be okay to eat, but it's not pizza without cheese. Have you ever played basketball with four players and the other team has five? It's not good to play on a basketball team with only four players and the other team has five. It's complete with five. Pizza is complete with cheese. A basketball team is complete with five players on the court. So also, we are not complete when we are alone and living in isolation. An article that was published on this past Christmas Eve in USA Today reports that Americans today, they're experiencing a brand new epidemic. It's not a virus or a new bacteria. It's loneliness. The USA Surgeon General states, most of us think that loneliness is just a bad feeling. 
But it turns out that loneliness has far greater implications for our health when we struggle with a sense of social disconnection, being lonely or isolated. The article defines loneliness as when the connections of a person, that when, the, when the connections a person needs in life are greater than the connections that they actually have. The opening chapters of the scriptures, God sees man alone and foresees the issue. Humanity is not complete without community. We are not designed for isolation. Our life is drained when we're alone. Our energy can't be sustained alone. Our purpose can't be fulfilled alone. Our joy can't be complete without another object of, to fulfill our joy. It is not good for us to be alone. Now, how many of us in our heart of hearts this morning, if I were to ask you honestly, if we're just you and I just chatting over coffee or potentially uh, in my office and there's nobody else there, how many, of, uh, how many of you would say to me, genuinely in your heart of hearts, you would say, you know what, my, my needs for connection are greater than the meaningful connections that I really have. How many in your heart of hearts would say, I'm lonely? Now I know, from being your pastor for the last number of years, that if we're honest with God and with one another, the number here of people who would say, you know what, I'm lonely, are probably over 50%, maybe even headed towards 75%. That's the bad news. Many of us are, are living alone. But the good news is that God doesn't desire for us to stay this way. So what's our antidote? What's the solution to our epidemic of loneliness? Where can genuine community be found? Now, we're tempted to satisfy our relational needs and our desire for social connection in our work. We, we, we tend to, uh, when we experience a, a need of the soul, to turn towards our work in hope that that will satisfy us. If we just bury ourselves in our work, then our other needs will just simply go away. Well, starting in verse 19, God describes the insufficiency of our work. Even though our work is dignified and good and, and right, it's insufficient. Look at verse 19. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. So God has, has created the animals, the birds of the heavens, the, the, the beasts of, of the earth, all of the living creatures, and then he brought, them, he brought them to the man, and the man was supposed to do a job. He used to be a good biologist and, and categorize them, give them names according to their function, what he was going to call them. God gives the authority to the man over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air to, to be a good biologist, to tell, to describe their, their nature and to label them and to have authority over them. This is in line with what God had said in Genesis chapter 1, verses 20, uh, 28, 28 and, and, 20, and 20, uh, yeah, in verse, in verse 28, that he had uh, given man dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. He continues... In verse 19, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Naming of the animals was God's way of saying to the man, like, you have authority over these animals. You are to, to rule and be a representative of me and my goodness over these animals as you are stewarding creation, managing my, managing my garden, and reflecting my glory in your creation. All of this was in accord with God's good design and purpose for the man. So, verse 20, he gets to work. The man gave names to all of the livestock to the birds of the heavens 
and to the beast of the field. He's hard at work. He's putting in his hours. He's doing his nine to five. He's doing what God had called him to do. Everything that, that, that God had asked for the man to accomplish in working and keeping the garden and everything that God had asked for the man to do in naming the animals according, uh, according to their kind and according to their purpose, the man got to work. He was putting on his hard hat, going to work, doing his job. Maybe he doesn't need anybody else if he can just do his work. If he can just put on his hard hat, accomplish the task for the day, then go home and sleep and get up the next day and just do it again. Maybe, that, maybe the sole purpose for which God has designed humanity is so that you could just get to work, do the job, go home and be happy. But that's not even the point of this entire pericope, this is verses, 19, verses 19 and 20. The whole point is for God to reveal even, in, even before sin even enters into the equation, humanity is not designed to work alone. Look at the end of verse 20. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. That's the main point of God describing the task that he had given to them with the animals. That man cannot find soul satisfaction that is, he's designed for in community in his work alone. He can't. He was designed for something more. He was designed for something greater. There was no helper fit for him. A recent study published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, that's a long-winded title for a journal, they, they discovered something revolutionary. I'm sure this study was commissioned by a, 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 universi a university and probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars have been poured into this study. And you know what the study found? The study concluded that there is a link between human well-being, sense of belonging, connectedness to community, and meaningful participation in daily life. Imagine that. A long-winded scholarly journal says, you're not designed to work alone. Your life is better when you're working together with other people in a community, and your life is more fulfilling. Thank you, International Journal for Environmental Research and Public Health, for telling us what Genesis chapter 2 has already affirmed very clearly. When people have a sense of belonging and they're connected to community and they have meaningful participation in daily life, their well being goes through the roof. If, if somebody comes into my office and says, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling with addiction. Just, I can't put down such and such of this, such and such of that. I, I'm, I'm just struggling with burying myself in my work, and it seems like all I do is go to work and then go home and work and go home. One of the first things I ask is, who is your most meaningful connection on earth? Who do, who do you connect with deeply and most? Who challenges you? Who pushes you to be the best person that you could possibly be? Who knows you inside and out? And not unanimously, not every single time, but in the majority of cases, with those types of people, most people say, I don't have anybody that fits that criteria. Well, let's start there. It doesn't matter how many cats you have, how loyal your dog is, they can't take the place of meaningful community with other human image bearers of God. Now, we don't ask you to become a member of Sierra Bible Church because we need to boost our numbers. We need to fill out our budget. We need to make sure we have enough people giving of their tithes. We ask you to become members of Sierra Bible Church because we know the truth of God's word as it's experienced in real life. You need a community. You need a people to belong to. A people to commit yourself to meaningfully the zoo is not sufficient. Animals are great. 
Biology is fantastic. Your work is meaningful, but it won't give you the life that you crave. Hikes in the wilderness are, are wonderful. They're beautiful. They're glorious. It's not going to satisfy your craving for community. You need people. Even the curmudgeonly character on the television show Parks and Recreation, Ron Swanson, his, his character is entirely built upon being alone. He uh, lives by himself in an address that he won't disclose to anybody else so that he doesn't get any mail from anybody else. He, he's built a cabin for himself in the woods where he buries his gold underneath in the, in, in the woods. He, he has built his entire identity on being alone. But even Ron Swanson, at one point in the television show, he must confess the truth that he needs other people. He says very succinctly, friends, one to three is sufficient. <laughs> It is not good for us to be alone. The animals, the wilderness, our jobs and our work and our education and our money will not fulfill the relational gap that only real human connection can provide. Now, some of us here in this room are actively working so hard in our jobs or in our hobbies, specifically because we think that if we are good enough at those things, it's going to be good enough for our soul. We don't need other people because we have a big enough bank account or we have a prestigious enough career or a prestigious enough degree or a demanding enough and fulfilling enough career. Brothers and sisters, no amount of money is worth sacrificing your most meaningful relationships. No educational degree is prestigious enough to provide the academic pride to sufficiently compensate for the human connection that you are designed for. Uh, Andrea and I met earlier this week with a, a financial advisor. The financial advisor asked us, like, now, Carl, if, if Andrea were to pass away, he's trying to sell us life insurance. <laughs> if Andrea were to pass away and her, her income from her job was, was no longer coming into the household, how much money would you need to, to live? That's a good question. A financial advisor should ask that in light of trying to sell us life insurance. He's just doing his job. But my answer probably wasn't what he's looking for. <laughs> I said, if she goes, I'm probably just going to go with her. <laughs> like, like, in all seriousness, our lives are so interdependent upon one another that money will be the last of my concerns if she passes away. If the Lord brings her home, I won't just need money. I'll need a mountain-sized amount of human connection that only she can provide to me. Our life and our work and our family are so interdependent, so entirely dependent upon one another that if either one of us passes, like everything is on the table for us. Why? Because in order for humanity to thrive, we need something more than just money. We need something more than just a job. We need one another. Now, after it's been sufficiently revealed that the man's job is, is not good enough for him, God supplies for his need in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. So after a long day of naming animals, he's tired. He's done his job of naming the animals, keep working and keeping the garden. God probably gives him a few beers, allows him to sit in the chair, the nice and comfy chair, allows him to see off into the sunset as it's going down, as he's looking upon all of his work and being satisfied, man, I just did a good job today. And he falls into a deep, deep sleep. God is the first anesthesiologist. And while he slept, God turns into the surgeon. While he slept, he took one of his sides, most of your translations say ribs, same word all throughout the Old Testament, it's never translated rib, always translated side. 
took one of his sides, but we don't, trans, we don't use the word sides because then it sounds like there's multiple parts to the man and he just like lopped off one side and did that. So that's why people translate it as rib. Also because it accords with bone of my bones later. But for our sake this morning, I'm gonna to explain to you that he took his side, closed up its place with flesh, And the side that the Lord God had taken from the man, he fashioned and made into a woman and brought her to the man. So God, just as God had formed the beasts of the field and brought them to the man and the man names them, does his job, now God causes the man to fall into a deep sleep and he takes from the man's side and fashions a beautiful woman. It's important to know that God takes her from his side and not his head, because she's not designed to rule over him. God takes her from the side because, and not his feet, because he's not to trample on top of her. God takes her from his side to see that that she is his partner. She is his equal. She is his one that is to partner in life, to work and to keep the garden alongside him. She is to be his helper as God has designed her to be. Then when God brings her to the man, all of the sudden, the man turns into a combination of Bruno Mars and Ed Sheeran. (laughs) The very first words that are uttered from the lips of humanity as recorded in Holy Scripture is a poem to the beauty and the praise of the woman that he sees. This at last, he says when he sees her. Now, now the term at last is is a Hebrew term that's in other places translated as foot or anvil. And I think that the the writer is is using this term to, to say that this at last, as I am going about my day, as I am doing my work, This is one who is in step with me. At the perfect time, at last, I have been provided for with everything that I need for my relation, for my relational, social needs to be satisfied. This at last is bone of my bones. She is like me. She's of the same substance as me. She is a human. This at last is bone of my bones and and flesh of my flesh. We're, we're We're of the same kind, she and I. And then he names her. He 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 gives her a name showing and and dignifying he's gonna be responsible for her. She shall be called woman. This is a play on the Hebrew, Hebrew term for man. The Hebrew term for man is ish. And now he's calling her isha. We're of the same substance. We're, you, you were, we're similar in our uh, identity as image bearers of God, but yet we are distinct in our gender. She shall be called woman. Isha, because she was taken out of a man, Ish. Now, I grew up skiing on the small hills of the Midwest, uh, the, the ski hills and the ski mountains, even though there's, there's lift tickets that you can get to the top, uh, basically they are the size of the hill in front of McQueen as you sled into the parking lot. Uh, McQueen High School, like that, that's what skiing in the Midwest was like. And I was passionate about it. I probably in high school skied about 50 to 100 days in the winter. 
But during my senior year of high school, I traveled to Colorado in January to ski the Rockies for the first time. And as I stood at the base of Breckenridge, Colorado, I exclaimed, finally, at last, a mountain worth skiing, the exact type of mountain my skis were designed for. And just as mountain, or just as skis are designed for mountains filled with snow, so also man is designed for the woman. She is made for him, and he is responsible for her. Now, we can fight this design. We can deny this design. We can ignore this design. We can try to change and manipulate this design. But when you're standing on top of a 13,000-foot mountain filled with deep snow, you better hope that you have a pair of skis that are perfectly designed for the Rockies and not just a pair of bricks. And just as floating down the mountain in rhythmic pattern of, of two perfectly designed skis, as snow blows over the top of your head, as beautiful and melodic pattern that makes the skier filled with joy, so also God's design of a man and a woman to harmoniously fit together to create a new community is good and beautiful and right. The goodness of, of God's design for humanity can't be experienced without men and women fulfilling their, their uniquely designed genders. It's good for a man to be a man in community. It's good for a woman to be a woman in community, full stop. And your gender, your gender is not defined by your biology. Your biology is defined by God's design for your gender. Don't mix these two things up. Before you were born, God decided to craft you as either a man or a woman. Your private parts don't determine your gender. Your decision to be the gender that you desire doesn't determine your gender. God does. God crafted your humanity and has declared over you long before you were born, long before you were knit together in your mother's womb. He's declared over you, you're a man or you're a woman. We can't change our gender any more than we can change a rock into a dog. Now, if we name a rock a dog, that doesn't make a rock a dog. It just makes us bad geologists. If we name a dog a rock, it doesn't make the dog a rock, it just makes us bad biologists. And if we name a man a woman, it doesn't make the man a woman, it just makes us bad image bearers of God. Amen. Community begins with a man and a woman praising their shared humanity and glorifying their beautiful distinctions that he has designed. The woman is good for the man. It is so good for a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman and for the man and the woman to create a new community together that God sanctifies their union, blesses their union. When God brings the man to the woman, this is the result that happens in verses 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. Now notice this statement assumes procreation. In this statement, he, the man has natural parents. Now the first man and the first woman, they didn't have a mother and a father, but moving forward, the man would leave the household of his birth, his mother and his father. Now, what's the reason for the man leaving the family community that he was born into? The man will leave, and then he will cleave. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Leave his home community, cleave to his wife to form a new community with her. The, the purpose for the man to leave the home and cleave to his wife in a new community is for their sexual pleasure. 
Sex is God's idea. We don't need to be embarrassed about it. It's God's idea for pleasure, for protection, for procreation. It's God's design for humanity to form a new community and the enjoyment of sexual pleasure in a covenant relationship. And there's no greater force for the flourishing of a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community than monogamous, heterosexual marriage. Full stop. And they shall become one flesh, chapter 20, or verse 24 says. Marriage is diverse because it, it brings together two completely different genders. Men and women, a man and a woman, forged into one flesh. Marriage is equitable because the man and the woman are made in the image of it and in likeness of God. They both have equal worth, equal value, equal dignity. It's equitable because all of the man's assets become the woman's and all of the woman's help become the man's. Marriage is inclusive because at creation, when it was designed, there's no pro prohibitions on the creational design. If creation were, would have to continue forward without sin, the man would be able to leave his household and cleave to his wife to be united to any one woman that he chooses. It's inclusive of the entire human race before sin entered the world. And this means, brothers and sisters, if we want our community, both our church community and our community at large, if we want our community to flourish for children and for children to thrive, the best thing that we can do for them is to love our spouse and stay committed to our marriage. Full stop. And if we do that, if we do that, we love our spouse, stay committed to our marriages, we'll have nothing to hide. The story closes with a stunning statement, and the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They're living together fully exposed to one another without any embarrassment or without anything to hide before one another or before God. So let's close down this message with where we began. Who are your people? Who is your community? Where do you belong? Who are the ones that form and forge the community that your soul craves? Now, we might be tempted to answer this question from this text as, well, my marriage, my spouse, my family that we have created, my neighborhood that I live in, and my nation that I live and serve among. However, the, the New Testament takes this text and unveils a profound mystery embedded within it that is revealed in the coming of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, the scripture quotes Genesis 2.24, the one that we had just quoted, that we just worked through. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. But the scriptures in the New Testament in Ephesians 5, it doesn't use this text to land on why heterosexual monogamy is important, although it affirms that in many other places. The scriptures say that the real reason God designed it this way is to proclaim the gospel. God designed marriages to be this way so that there would be a physical, tangible expression of, of the gospel. Verse 32 in Ephesians chapter 5. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Like, where does that come from, Paul? How does, what do you mean? A man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and that has, has something to do with Christ and his church? What? Think about it. The passage is about a man leaving his father, his father, to be united to his bride, to form a new community, to be united and to form a new community. The gospel tells us Jesus left his father in heaven to die for the sin of his people. His death purifies his people as a spotless bride. And the spiritual union that exists within the church culminates in a new home, in the new heavens and the new earth. So this means if you are in Christ, you have a new community, a new family, 
that's going to last forever. So the beginning of your cure for loneliness doesn't start with joining a new neighborhood club or even getting married. The beginning for your solution to your loneliness and finding the community that your soul craves starts with you coming to Jesus. You seeing that he has left his father in heaven to come and live and dwell among us, to die for the sinful, dirty bride like ourselves, to purify us, to make us white as snow, to unite us together in a gathering in his church so that one day when he returns for us, we will be with him and with one another and with God himself forever. This is what marriage is supposed to signify to the world. And that's why the whole discussion about marriage and gender, in, in all of it, the gospel is at stake. This isn't a political issue. First and foremost, it's primarily a theological issue. Marriage proclaims the gospel when done the, when, when done the way that God designed it. And it is my prayer and, and my hope that even in the messiness of this world, so filled with sin, so filled with, with divorces and gender dysphoria and confusion about sexuality and who we're attracted to and all of these types of things, that my, my prayer is that in the middle of all of the confusion, of all of the struggles and all of the trials and, and everything that fills our minds in the midst of this dark, dark world, that we would see clearly the beauty of Jesus. See clearly a, a way that, that God has designed from the very beginning that Jesus came back to reconcile, to, to, to redeem us back into. And that means probably for us, as we're working alongside of people who struggle deeply in these areas that I have just proclaimed to you so clearly, it's going to take a long amount of patience and love. It's going to take a long amount of prayer and sacrifice and, and intentionality to discern and decide this is what we mean by marriage and this is what we don't mean. This is why we are proclaiming this for human flourishing and this is why we're not. And being patient and walking with people who struggle with seeing God's beautiful and glorious design. Can we be that as a people? Uh, lastly here, I know some of you probably in this room have, have never met Jesus, have never entered into a relation, covenant relationship with him to purify you of your sins and to, to be adopted into his new family and new community that he is building. And, and I don't want today to escape us without you being invited by him to put, put your faith in him. And uh, at the conclusion of the service, I'm gonna pray we're going to sing some songs, and then there'll be uh, a few elders over here that would love to walk with you uh, and pray with you about what it means to begin following Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all that you have done and all that you have designed. God, we pray that God, that you would help us to see your scriptures clearly, to tremble at your revelation, to forge new community, and first and foremost, to come to you. God, we thank you for Jesus being sent from the Father to redeem a an impure bride like us to help us be united to him. To adopt us into a new family and a new community. God, and I pray for people in this gathering who you are calling, you are wooing to yourself. God, I pray that today would be the day in which you seal the deal that you adopt them into a new family, you pronounce over them that they are a redeemed man, a redeemed woman, adopted into a new family. God, we ask and pray for you to be clear to us, to help us to walk in faithfulness to you, to forge deep and meaningful bonds that break the power of loneliness, 
that allow for us to be vulnerable with you and with one another and allow for us to receive the help that our soul craves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.